Good morning. Um, we're still waiting for some people um, to join uh, this morning's webinar, but uh, we do have a lot to get through and we've reached the appointed time. So um, I think we'll begin now. Um, good morning. My name is Alistair Cantor um, and I, along with my colleague Sarah Salmon, will be presenting to you today on the subject, the cost of getting it wrong, ASB and the Equality Act 2010. Um, now, I'd like to begin by um, bidding you a very warm welcome uh, from not only Sarah and I, but also Cornstone Barristers Chambers to today's seminar. And we are delighted to see so many people attending today's presentation and um, from a variety of different backgrounds within the housing sector. We have um, people um, who are accust accustomed to representing landlords, those more accustomed to representing tenants. We have legal representatives and we have um, in-house staff actually dealing with ASB on the ground. And we certainly hope that there will be something in today's webinar for everyone. Uh, as we go through, um, I would invite um, those who have attended and who have questions for us to use the Q&A function in Zoom to pose questions. Um, we may be able to address some of them as we go through. Um, and also we hope to um, permit a bit of time at the end of the webinar to go through any questions that remain. Now, in terms of an overview of what we will be covering today, um, we're, we're firstly going to be discussing the case of Rosebury Housing Association Limited and Williams and Another. Now, this recent decision, judgment was handed down in December of 21, led us here to believe um, that it would be good to um, examine some of the themes uh, raised by the case. Uh, and what that case showed were efforts by a landlord to control um, ASB, which went uh, quite badly wrong at trial. Now, it's not intended today to dwell on the judgment in that case, rather, we intend to use it as a talking point to discuss ways that those in the housing sector can navigate similar issues effectively. And um, from the second bullet point on this slide, I, I've set out uh, a list of topics that we'll be covering today, um, but boiling it, boiling it down to two key issues, really what we want to look at today is recognising when the Equality Act may bite in the context of antisocial behaviour, and secondly, navigating the consequent issues that arise when it does. And we hope that by the end of today, we will have gone some way to helping you achieve um, those outcomes uh, better uh, when faced with them. So first of all, I, I'd like to just have a brief run through of the case of Rosebery for the benefit of those attending who may not have had the opportunity to read the judgment. Um, the claim was um, for an antisocial behaviour injunction under the 2014 Act against the Housing Association's tenant under a shared ownership lease. Um, there was initially a claim against the tenant's mother, but that was compromised um, at the outset of trial by way of undertakings. The landlord initially rel relied on some 123 allegations of ASB, but at a case management hearing, a district judge had required the landlord to limit itself to six uh, representative instances of ASB. And the ASB relied on a trial consisted of um, the three matters at the third bullet point, verbal abuse, taking photographs of a neighbour, and also an instance of noise nuisance. Now, it's important um, to recognise the broader factual context, which is that the tenant um, was accustomed to filming um, her neighbours, and also she was accustomed to getting into her car and either driving up and down the road and the immediate surroundings, or, or sometimes simply sitting in her car for a period of time. And now we move to the factual background of the counterclaim. 
So in fact, the tenant suffered from obsessive compulsive disorder and its manifestations included the matters that we referred to on the last slide. There was an obsessive filming of surroundings and also um, driving up and down or sitting in the car, uh, which the tenant found calmed herself. And the tenant brought a counterclaim under various sections of the Equality Act 2010, but the primary claim was that the landlord, by bringing and continuing claims for an injunction, had unlawfully subjected the tenant to a detriment because of something arising in consequence of her disability, i.e. a claim under Section 15 of the Equality Act 2010. Now, um, the decision on the claim went against the landlord and in fairly decisive fa fashion. The court found that five out of the six allegations of ASB were not proven, uh, basically for two reasons. Um, in most cases, the evidence in support was either missing, so it wasn't spoken to in the witness statements of the people giving oral evidence, there, might, there was hearsay evidence only, um, and the hearsay evidence was unsupported by uh, contemporaneous records and documentation, or in some instances, the court found that um, the evidence of, of those who did give live evidence was unreliable. And in the um, instance of the tenant photographing um, her neighbour, the court found that was nowhere near ASB in the circumstances. Um, the sixth allegation of ASB was proven, and that was the allegation of noise nuisance. But um, the court had no hesitation in finding there should be no injunction on the basis of that allegation of noise nuisance, uh, because it, it had only been taking place over a brief period. It was addressed when the local authority got involved uh, and served, I think, an abatement notice, and there were no ongoing issues. So the court had no hesitation in finding it was not just and convenient to impose an injunction on that basis. The position on the counterclaim was rather different and that succeeded. And on this slide, I've set out in essence why that was. So um, as I've set out on the left-hand side, in the first instance, the court found that there was unfavorable treatment due to disability. By the time of trial, the landlord had accepted that this tenant was disabled and there had been expert evidence provided um, secondly, the pursuit of proceedings constituted a detriment. And thirdly, this was due to something arising from the tenant's disability. The court looked at the broader factual background and said, really, um, it was more than a trivial part of the reason why the landlord um, was seeking injunction um, was the filming and the driving around in, in the car by the tenant. And that was why the, the landlord was seeking an injunction. The court went on to consider proportionality and it found that while the landlord's aims were legitimate, the proceedings were not proportionate. And I've set the key points out on the right hand side there. Um, the allegations had not been put to the tenant in a timely fashion, so she was being asked to consider them very much after the event. Um, it did not seek medical advice to understand the tenant's disability. The landlord did not seek to foster understanding between the neighbours. In fact, the court was somewhat critical of the advice given to some of the neighbours, which was to film the tenant filming them, which the court found tended to exacerbate matters. Um, the landlord didn't explore the tenant's offer to move. Uh, at one stage, the tenant had said, would it be best if, if I moved elsewhere and, and you cooperate with me in facilitating that? And finally, the landlord had pursued the claim all the way to trial despite compelling evidence having been adduced by this time by the tenant. So what was the outcome? Well, firstly, the landlord was ordered to pay quite substantial damages to the tenant of £27,500, and that represented purely injury to feelings. So there was a substantial liability and damages, and presumably, although the judgment doesn't refer to it, there would have been cost liabilities paying by the landlord as well. Well, the second part of the outcome was not just financial, but reputational. And the court made um, what I would describe as trenchant criticism of the landlord's conduct of the case and claim. And you'll find terms like forensic disaster 
and that it was extraordinary to have pressed the claim to trial in the way it did in the judgment. Um, so that's what happened in Rosebery. Uh, and um, moving on, we'd now like to discuss um, the lessons that arise from the case and how um, those in the housing sector can navigate the issues that are referred in it. And the first thing I'd like to talk about is recognising when the Equality Act is engaged in an ASB case. Now, I've set out on the next few slides just a few of the key aspects of the Equality Act 2010. I don't want to dwell on them um, as I want to move on to the more substantial matters, but um, on that slide you'll see the list of protected characteristics, um, a bullet point list of the main duties, you have um, duties not to discriminate, uh, and we term those direct discrimination, indirect discrimination, um, uh, and um, discri unlawful discrimination arising from disability. You have the duty to make reasonable adjustments uh, and the public sector equality duty. And there's also specific provision made in the Equality Act for um, persons in the housing sector, including uh, managers of premises under section 35 of the Equality Act. I wanted to set out in full section 15. That is the provision of the Equality Act that was um, in issue or, or the main thing at trial that was an issue in Rosebery. And also, um, in my experience, it is the type of discrimination um, claim or counterclaim one is most likely to see in the context of an ASB claim. And I've set the provision out in full there. Um, a person discriminates against a disabled person if they treat them unfavorably because of something arising in consequence of their disability. And secondly, that person cannot show the treatment is a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. And subsection two states that the first subsection does not apply if the person did not know or could not reasonably have been expected to know that the other person had a disability. And you will note that I have emboldened um, certain passages from that statutory provision. And the reason being, they are the key issues um, to consider um, in any case involving section 15. And we'll come on to discuss them in a bit more detail. Um, a few other points to note in brief is there is a, a, a partial reversal of the burden of proof in a discrimination claim. If the tenant um, shows um, some facts from which the court could infer that discrimination had taken place without an alternative explanation, that's what it must hold, unless um, the uh, landlord in the housing context can prove that they did not discriminate. And um, as noted on the third bullet point, um, what that often involves is the landlord attempting to prove that it, it was acting proportionately in pursuit of a legitimate aim. So on this slide, uh, we discuss when the Equality Act is most likely to be engaged in an antisocial behaviour context. And the first point is that almost invariably the protected characteristic that is, is going to be engaged is disability. And the second point is that almost any significant intervention by the landlord, whether that be a formal warning, the issue of an NOSP, a letter before action, or indeed issuing proceedings, is likely to be held as unfavourable treatment for the purposes of the Equality Act. Therefore, in my view, uh, in the ASB contact, context, the Equality Act is likely to be engaged whenever the landlord knows or might reasonably be expected to know the tenant has a protected characteristic or disability. Um, so I've set out on this side what I think the key, the key questions are um, when you uh, come across a Section 15 claim in the ASB context. Number one, does the landlord know or are they reasonably to be expected to know that the tenant has a protected characteristic or specifically a disability? Secondly, is the antisocial behaviour something arising in consequence of that protected characteristic or disability? And thirdly, are the landlord's actions 
a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. And I've, I've placed an asterisk on that last point because really proportionality, the section I've underlined, is, is going to be the key issue of, in that question because generally speaking, if a landlord is trying to control ASB for the benefit of, of its other tenants, that is probably going to be held a legitimate aim. So this brings me on to the next section of today's presentation, which is assessing disability. And um, really just going back to these three questions, um, that's gonna deal with questions one or two. Um, both of those questions involve an assessment of an individual's disability and its effects. The third point as to proportionality will be dealt with um, by Sarah in due course. So when you're trying to assess disability, there are, in my view, again, four key questions. The first is whether the individual is suffering an impairment at all. So, so do they have some sort of condition or impairment? Um, it might be that that can just be accepted if you see some form of medical records showing that they have been diagnosed with the condition. There's three more questions uh, which can be uh, uh, more um, difficult to resolve. Secondly, whether the impairment has a substantial and long-term adverse effect on their ability to carry out day-to-day -day life. Um, thirdly, whether the ASB is something arising in consequence of the disability. So is there a causal link between the ASB and the disability? Uh, and fourthly, whether and in what means the ASB can actually be addressed. So I've set out on this slide the definition of a disability under the Equality Act. Um, so it, it means a physical or mental impairment which has a substantial or long-term adverse effect on the person's ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities. Uh, substantial is defined by the Act as meaning more than minor or trivial, uh, and long-term means it has lasted or is likely to last um, longer than 12 months. And I've, I've throughout these slides, I've put the section in underlined text in case you need to go and look it up after today's webinar. Uh, now, as I've noted on the final bullet point, um, that is mainly going to be a question of fact, whether that test is met in each particular case. Uh, now, the Act does make special provision for particular categories of impairment. Uh, so on the left, um, I've set out a number of conditions that the Act prescribes as disabilities. So you have blindness or partial or impaired sightedness, cancer, HIV, and multiple sclerosis. Um, also dealt with on the left there are the special cases that the Act um, deals with. So you have um, corrective measures. There's a provision that says, if someone has an impairment and it would have an effect, um, but for the fact that person is using some form of aid or medication, um, it's treated as an impairment nonetheless. Um, there's also a special provision for progressive conditions. So if someone has a progressive condition that isn't yet um, having um, a substantial um, adverse effect, but it will do in the fullness of time, that's to be treated as an impairment too. There's also a special provision for children under six years of age. Um, on the right hand side, I set out the list of um, ailments or conditions that the Equality Act specifically says are not to be treated as disabilities. Uh, and I, I, I don't think we need to go through the list. The one I would um, highlight in the context is addiction to alcohol or nicotine or any other sub substance is not to be considered a disability. Uh, and one often sees in the ASB context that there may be um, addictions in the background and that may form part of the factual matrix. But the Equality Act says they don't constitute disabilities. So um, when is a landlord reasonably expected to know of the disability? Um, and I think I may end up answering at least one of the questions that has gone up in the Q&A at this point, um, but I'll, I'll come back and actually um, type an answer when I finish speaking. Um, but really, it all depends on the circumstance of the case. You might have a situation where the landlord actually knows. 
so the landlord has already been provided with notice perhaps a letter from a gp some form of medical records and they know that there's a disability but what if that has not taken place well um if as a landlord you're under the public sector equality duty which is something um, sarah will be looking at in a bit more detail later in the webinar but if you are under that uh, public sector equality duty it imposes on you a duty to make reasonable inquiries um, in certain circumstances as to whether um, a tenant is disabled and um, the relevant features of that disability. And I've put on that slide a quote from the case of London Quadrant Housing Trust and Patrick, which I think is um, a neat encapsulation of how far the duty goes, uh, which I hope will be of some assistance to those attending. Uh, the court in that case said that the public sector landlord is not required in every case to take active steps to inquire into whether the person subject to its decision is disabled and if so is disabled in a way relevant to the decision where however some feature or features of the information available to the decision maker raises a real possibility this may be the case then a duty to make further inquiry arises so if there's nothing on the facts of the case um, that indicate uh, there could be a disability in effect. Um, it, it doesn't mean you, as a matter of routine, have to ask um, a perpetrator of potential ASB whether they're suffering from a, a disability. However, if there is something on the facts of the case that really should lead you to think, well, it's a real possibility um, that there's a disability here, it's a real possibility that is um, influencing the ASB, you have to make some reasonable inquiries. Uh, and that might include writing to the tenant, asking for, for some more information. So I've moved on now to discuss um, the next key part of um, section 15 and the second question from the key question slide, which is what does something arising in consequence of? Well, what the law says is that um, to bring the situation within section 15, um, the disability need only be an effective and not the sole cause of the unfavourable treatment. And again, I've uh, put a quote there from the case of Nag Nagarajan, uh, where the court said, what you're looking for is uh, for the particular matter to be a cause, the activating cause, a substantial and effective cause, a substantial reason or an important factor. Um, so the court listed off um, a, a variety of different ways you might you might phrase effectively an effective reason. So if the disability is contributing or it's an effective reason um, for the landlord, um, uh, for the tenant behaving in the way it is and the landlord taking action to control it, um, that will be enough to bring it within scope. Um, even if there are other contributory factors. Now, um, there can be a degree of complexity when you're considering um, this. So, um, for example, as I've noted on the first bullet point, um, you may find complexity is introduced where there is more than one potential cause of the ASB and only one engages the Equality Act. And I've set out on the second bullet point what one might think is a typical example, one might see in the ASB context, you have a tenant um, engaging in ASB who suffers from a mental health condition. Here I've, I've set schizophrenia, um, which is a disability, but at the same time, they are suffering from alcoholism, which the act um, excludes from being a disability. Which of those is the cause of the ASB? Well, Again, the test you're looking for is whether the disability is an effective cause of the ASB. So it need not be the sole cause. So in this particular instance, you'd have to look at um, the schizophrenia and the alcoholism. Uh, you'd have to look at how they were feeding into the ASB. And if the schizophrenia was um, forming a, an effective reason uh, for the tenant engaging in ASB, that would be enough to bring it within section 15, even if um, 
uh, the alcoholism was also a significant factor. So um, I've set out on this slide um, a, a sort of best practice list of the ways a landlord can assess assessing disability uh, effectively. Uh, the first point I'd note is training, um, which I think may, may be obvious, but it's an important point. It's ensuring that the staff who are going to be dealing with tenants uh, more generally and specifically um, in the ASB context are given um, training on the Equality Act and the duties that arise so they know what to do. Um, the second bullet point is again very important. Um, it's an appointment that's made over and again in all sorts of different contexts in the social housing sector, and that is record keeping. Um, landlords really should strive to ensure their record keeping is up to scratch, and that when information is being imparted that may indicate the disability or the effects of disability, it's being recorded. So that might be on the initial act inspections, but also um, uh, tenancy inspections and indeed any interaction with the tenant or with third parties. Um, thereafter, it's about assessing um, the knowledge that you have as the landlord. So number one, the existing knowledge. What does the housing file show? Does the housing file show you that this tenant is disabled? Uh, and secondly, the obtainable knowledge. Um, so we've already referred um, to the duties that arise um, in the context of, of the public sector equality duty. Uh, a landlord um, should probably be inviting a tenant to cooperate, asking for medical evidence. And um, if a pre-action protocol or review process is engaged, um, hopefully that is the sort of thing that would elicit relevant information. The last bullet point in the right hand column um, is a vexed question and indeed some of the people attending today flagged it in advance as an area of interest. What, what is a landlord supposed to do when the tenant who may have a disability simply will not engage, simply will not cooperate? And the question I pose in the slide is does that lack of information or the non-cooperative tenant preclude assessing disability? Well, well, the answer, I'm afraid there is no easy answer, um, but the answer is yes, it will hinder it to varying degrees. Um, I think there's, there's sort of three points that arise. Number one, the position when simply no evidence is provided. So I mean, there must be some evidence of disability uh, provided to the landlord for the Equality Act to be engaged. Um, so if there's a situation where um, the tenant simply says, I have a mental health condition, but doesn't provide any further information about that. Um, if um, the tenant uh, says, well, I've got a specific condition and doesn't provide any further evidence at all and will not cooperate. Well, um, I think in those circumstances, the landlord's entitled um, to operate on the assumption that there's not a disability until they see something that, that leads them to conclude otherwise. Um, the second um, scenario that might arise is there might be some existing knowledge of disability, but what exists is unsatisfactory. Um, so an example might be where um, a landlord has seen evidence of a diagnosis uh, but they might not be able to, uh, they might not have further information about how it manifests, how treatment may um, uh, assist with the position. Now, I think in those situations, uh, a landlord has to conduct some form of assessment um, in any event um, once they've uh, made their reasonable inquiries. But it might mean um, that their hands are tied to a certain degree. It might mean that um, it feeds into an assessment of proportionality. You know, we can't consider lesser measures because we don't have the information that would lead us to conclude something less than the action we're intending would cure the position. The third point that I think arises in this context is keeping the matter under review. And that applies generally in the Equality Act context. Um, you know, the factual position changes 
So it might be that the starting point is the tenant doesn't cooperate. You don't have the information you need to make a, an assessment of disability, but then something happens. The tenant provides some information um, and you can assess the position. And indeed, using Rosebury as an example, the tenant in that case seems to have provided um, quite substantial um, amounts of information to the landlord that might have enabled it to consider its options. Uh, so the landlord should always keep it under review in terms of disability as and when further information is provided. Um, the final point is um, expert evidence. When is it necessary? And again, this is a question that's been posed by numerous people um, in advance of attending. And the answer is that, well, it may be necessary at any time, pre or post issue, and it probably will be necessary at some point in most cases uh, that are litigated. And there are two, two forms of expert evidence, so formal and, fo and informal. Formal expert evidence is what's going to be required in the litigation arena for the most part. If you're going back to the key questions um, of, you know, does it have a substantial and long lasting adverse effect? Um, is there a link between the disability and the ASB? How is the ASB to be addressed? Um, those are the areas where expert evidence is almost invariably going to be required in, in the context of litigation. Um, and it would be probably be formally instructed at, at expert evidence under the provisions of part 35 of the civil procedure rule. Um, I've also highlighted on this slide informal um, expert evidence. And again, referring to Rosebury, um, you can see that informal expert evidence, which you might obtain, for example, charitable organisations um, whose object is to assist people with particular conditions, they might be in a position to assist you as a landlord um, with how to deal with a particular tenant. Um, whether the way the tenant is behaving is to be expected, whether there are um, methods or, or actions that a landlord could take that might serve to uh, address the situation without the need um, to, for example, seek an injunction or seek possession. Um, so while informal expert evidence won't help you with, you know, actual disputed um, issues about um, technical legal points in the proceedings, it may well be something that a landlord can seek out and it will help them when they're doing their proportionality assessments and um, seeking to comply with their public sector quality duty. Um, that brings me to the end of the section on assessing disability and I'll now hand over to Sarah who will take you through uh, the remaining uh, parts of today's webinar. Hello. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you, Alistair. Um, I am first going to deal with proportionality. Um, this is in the context, really, of Section 15 and everything Alistair has already gone through. So this is where a case is likely to be won or lost. Can I have the first slide, please, Alistair? And essentially it where you have a disability and where section 15 is going to be engaged you need to make sure that you have good record keeping keeping within your organization so you can really make a good assessment on the proportionality of the proceedings when it comes to the equality act and also you must look at early consideration. Now, most of the cases so far, particularly in the higher courts, have been dealing with possession proceedings. And so it's clear, for example, that prior to the service of a notice of seeking possession, if you have someone who falls within the definition of a disability, then you need to be conducting a proportionality assessment. And you need to keep that under review as different and other information um, uh, comes to your attention. But equally, it applies to cases like we've seen in Rosebury. So it does apply as well to any type of action you might be contemplating and bringing. So perhaps when you send that first warning letter, 
that says you are considering applying to the court for an injunction because of the behaviour at the property. Think about whether or not at that stage a proportionality assessment needs to be carried out. Next slide, please, Alistair. And we all know in terms of possession proceedings what Lady Hale said in ASTA communities, but it is equally relevant to any other action you are taking. And the main takeaways for the purposes of this webinar today is that it should be a structured approach and that there is a balance that needs to be struck, struck a balance between the impact on the tenant and the importance to the landlord of what it is trying to achieve. And that structured approach, as we can see on the next slide, um, has been uh, derived from uh, European Union law and was um, set out in ELIAS. And we all should know now what that structured approach is. So is the objective uh, sufficiently important to justify limiting a fundamental right? Is the measure rationally collect connected to the objective? And are there other means that might accomplish the objective short of what you are currently doing as an organisation? So what does this mean in practice? If we can go to the next slide, please, Alistair. So most of us have been operating under an understanding that lesser measures uh, really means what other things um, could you or have you tried have they worked will they work um, and looking at it like that so if you're at the possession claim stage what about injunctions what about abcs and so on and so forth however as we've seen in rosemary uh, his honor judge lubacusi in any event um, looked at it in far broader terms than that. And that should be in the mind of anyone who is bringing proceedings. So in Rosebury, obviously, as Alistair set out, Cara, the tenant, um, was being treated unfavorably because of something arising uh, due to a disability. There was no argument from the defendant that Rosebury weren't trying to achieve legitimate aims. So it really did come back to come down to the proportionality of the measure. Now, what you need to look at is you need to look at acting swiftly in any investigation and not putting the onus onto residents. Now, what that looked like in Rosebury, by way of example, is that the allegations were made primarily between 2018 and early 2020. But it wasn't until late April 2020 that 123 allegations, the details of the allegations, rather than generalizations, were put to the tenant. And that, His Honour Judge Luber says, was not good enough and was a failure on behalf of the Housing Association. And in terms of placing the onus onto other residents, his Honour Judge Luber described it at paragraph 150 as not adding fuel to the fire. So what essentially had happened in that case where residents were encouraged to film and video one another and one another's behaviours in relation to alleged antisocial behaviour. And what the court said was, is there a neutral option? Is there something that you can do as the landlord or another organisation could do, for example, the police potentially, that could mean that you're not placing the onus on the residents to gather the evidence, if you like. The next main thing that will fall under proportionality is attempting to try and understand the disability. And that may mean you seeking medical advice or medical evidence, and Alistair has touched on that. But equally, if you have just got what you've got on your file, you could look at charitable organisations or other organisations that help uh, with particular disabilities, particularly mental health disabilities. You have charities like Mind and so on and so forth, who might be able to help you understand um, about a tenant's disability and the impact 
that may have upon their behaviour and how they react to certain situations. Look to see whether you can foster an understanding between neighbours. Now, this can be difficult because a lot of people who suffer from disabilities and particularly mental health disabilities, they don't want their private information disseminated to, to everybody. But it's about trying to sit down and engage with that particular person, explain how it might help if you can understand to other people who live around that person, um, if they could understand what, we're, what was going on with them personally, to see if you can generally make sure that everyone is able to try and get along as best you can, knowing the difficulties one particular person has. And there's various ways you can look at doing this. And there's some examples on, on there. The obvious thing I missed out was obviously, uh, you can look at multi-agency meetings as well in terms of what other people involved in the case or other people that should be involved in the case could do in helping to foster an understanding uh, within the neighborhood. Um, you can also involve charities and other organizations again, potentially. Um, one, when I attended a seminar some time ago now, uh, one thing that Housing um, Association had done up north um, was with surrounded difficulties between um, youths uh, playing sort of football and everything in an area where there's quite a lot of elderly residents. And what they did was they decided to hold afternoon teas where the uh, young people would serve the elderly residents. So they get to know one another. And that seemed to be an initiative that was working and did reduce the amount of complaints there were about these young people playing uh, football, banging balls against things, generally making noise in the area. So do try and explore um, other avenues. And that obviously includes explore anything that the tenant is suggesting. One of the criticisms in Rosebury, which Alistair has already touched on, is that the tenant was suggesting that she maybe could financially try and move. Um, and that was something that uh, wasn't engaged, uh, the, the Housing Association didn't engage with her on. Um, then we have the lesser measures, which we're all sort of aware of, support, referrals, ABCs, CPNs, any sort of abatement notices, injunction if you're ultimately thinking, well, we might have to go for possession, and moves where it's not the tenant suggesting it, but it might be uh, something that you uh, want to explore. And that can be moves for either the perpetrator or, of course, um, the victims, depending on how uh, the case develops and what the issues actually are. Uh, I, I'm, the other thing that you need to look at when you're looking at, at proportionality is keeping your policies in mind. So one of the main criticisms in Rosemary was, uh, Rosebury was that this case was just completely mismanaged. The Housing Association had policies in place, an antisocial behaviour policy, which contained all the arrangements for handling antisocial behaviour complaints, how they should be documented, how they should be investigated. And the fact that the policy wasn't applied meant that errors occurred. And as a result of those errors, um, the proportionality test uh, simply wasn't satisfied. And I'm just gonna pause there to answer live, I think one of the questions that we've had about whether or not the Equality Act um, concerns others and not just the tenant. Well, in terms of section 15 and proportionality and so on and so forth, obviously you're looking at whether or not a disability is causing behavior. There's, there's the causation and Alice has already been through that. So if, for example, you do have a case where it's not the tenant causing the behavior, but someone else in the household, then it may well be that that person within the household causing the behavior does have some sort of disability. So it's going to be highly relevant and you would still have to go through all the steps and consider proportionality of your actions. Um, and I'm now going to move on to the public sector equality duty. And if I can have the first main slide on the public sector equality duty, um, Alistair, in relation to uh, that duty, it has been held that it doesn't just, it's not just about the tenant. So it will be relevant if there are other people within the household that have disabilities and you're thinking about, for example, evicting the household, the public sector equality uh, duty will need to be considered. Equally, you might have 
residents and other neighbours who are the complainants who have um, disabilities of some description. And of course, the Public Sector Equality Act duty will also um, apply to them. So that weighs into the balance as well. So in that sense, the public sector equality duty is much broader and needs to be considered uh, more broadly dependent on the circumstances of the case. And we know, as I've set out on the next slide, that the public sector equality uh, duty applies to individual cases. Now, I've just noted a Swan, the Swan Housing Association case at the bottom of this slide. Now, that's quite an old case, but it was a case that was dealing with injunctive relief. And um, that was where effectively there was no medical evidence before the court. And what the judge did was consult sort of a medical dictionary and come to his own conclusions as to how the defendant's Asperger's syndrome might have impacted on his behaviour. And the Court of Appeal said, no, you can't do that. The fact that someone might uh, has a mere likelihood of having a disability the court can't go off on a frolic of its own it has to have some sort of evidence uh, before it when it's uh, when considering section 149 so uh, on the next slide i've set out um section 149 um in view of the time i don't plan on going through what section 149 um says the important thing um, is that although it is a lengthy section and it has been held in the higher courts that officers dealing with the duty do not have to be able to set it out completely verbatim, know it off by heart in the witness box, but you do need to have an understanding of it because you have to make informed decisions in relation to the Public Sector Equality Act duty. So if you don't understand it, it's difficult to see as was said in the Rosebury case, how an informed decision can be made off the back of it. And the next slide as well just sets out um, another part, the main, uh, main public sector equality act duty. And of course, we know that it's a duty to have due regard. So what have the cases said about the duty? Alistair, if we can move on a couple of slides, please. To the bracking slide. So it's important to record the steps um, taken by the person making the decision. It's important to see what you've taken into account and also what you knew at the time. So when you first carry out um, a proportionality or a public sector equality act duty uh, assessment, it may be that you don't know a lot. And that can develop over time. So you keep this under review. It's a continuing duty to have due regard. And it may be that what you know changes over time and you can easily uh, document that. Um, you must keep an open mind. It must be exercised with rigour. Um, and how much weight is to be given to certain things is a matter for you as the decision maker. And that's not for the court and that was all of those principles as you can see on the next slide were reiterated um, by mr justice turner in the london and quadrant housing trust and patrick case which alistair has already referred to alistair can we have the next slide please and oh sorry you've gone one too far can we just go back so the Public Sector Equality Act duty is not a duty to achieve a result. So when you see pleadings that say, um, in order to comply with the duty, you must move someone to a different property, it, it's, it's not a duty to do that. It's not a duty to secure someone with an alternative home, for example. Um, the rigour and open mind, not a tick box exercise, was reiterated in Patrick. Um, so was the ongoing nature of the, the duty. But it's point seven. So if you're being conscientious, and especially if proportionality is part of your assessment, because proportionality is, can be closely tied to the uh, PSED in, in terms of compliance, you may be able to comply with the duty even where you're unaware 
of the existence of it as a separate duty in section 149. So that's the sort of thing where if you've carried out your proportionality assessment correctly, and you've looked at that very carefully, then it's potentially likely on balance that you have also complied with the public sector equality duty. And it's just about being clear and making sure um, your the structure of your assessment shows the balance you're trying to achieve. On the next slide, there are a variety of cases. These have all been discussed in previous webinars. At the end of these slides, there is links to those uh, webinars, so I'm not going to go through them in any detail. Some of these cases, as most of you will know, will also, uh, also deal with what happens if there has been a breach. Can you correct it later down the line? Um, the answer to that in the main has been, yes, you may be able to um, correct it later down the line, but the focus of this webinar is getting it, it right in the first place. But you can go to those cases or go to the other webinars that Cornerstone Barristers have, have given uh, uh, for a full discussion on those. So let's look at what it potentially means in practice, going back to Rosebury, which is on the next slide. So th the comments on PSED in the Rosebury case are relatively limited. But what His Honour Judge Luber said was this was a case where the social housing provider needed to acknowledge uh, and become familiar with and then discharge the public sector equality act duty with vigour. So that's what he said about it. And he did find that that hadn't been done. And again, you will see from this PowerPoint slide that the crossover with the proportionality assessment. So it's about understanding and familiarising yourself with medical conditions and their impact. It's about seeking advice, specialist advice, if you feel you need it for your case. Um, what can you do to help others understand the medical edition, uh, conditions? And make sure any staff dealing with these sorts of tricky issues have training and learning so they are able to deal with the issues. And think about, it is a delicate and difficult task. And I think there's been, I can see from the chat, lots of emails coming through. And I think there's been discussion about sharing your proportionality and public sector equality act duty, um, sort of, I hesitate to call it checklist because it's not a tick box exercise, but the forms you use um, and the questions you answer. And in my experience, it's good to have an introduction. At the end of the day, you're going to be bringing legal proceedings off the back of this uh, if you get that far. And it's about painting a picture for the court. So have an introduction. Then look at the question, what are the aims and objectives in taking step for the purpose of securing an eviction or for the purpose of obtaining an injunction or whatever you might be trying to achieve? Is there a rational connection between your objectives and what is being sought. What is the problem? Deal with this in some detail. What is the antisocial behaviour, the nuisance, the annoyance? Is there any criminal behaviour that you need to document in there? Who are the occupiers? Who are the occupiers of the property where you say the problem is coming from, but equally the surrounding properties? There are a number of quite tricky cases in this arena work that happen in supported housing. So not only is the resident's cause, resident causing the problem, often got a variety of dis disabilities, including mental health uh, issues, but equally everyone around um, him or her also may have disabilities, including mental health disabilities. And that will really impact on your on how you assess the balance, because those people need uh, protecting and are of, often extremely vulnerable. So it's not just about the person, it's about doing a broader assessment, as I've already touched upon. Is there any action, is this particular action, sorry, no more than is absolutely necessary to achieve your aims and objectives? And does the action strike a, a fair balance between your objectives and any disadvantages that might be caused to the person who's the subject of the assessment, the disabled occupier or tenant? Are there any 
known difficulties. So discuss what reports you've seen, discuss what medical evidence you have. Um, as can be seen in Rosemary, people are some some people are far more forthcoming with the medical evidence. I've had a lot of cases where they won't even show you the medical evidence. But if you haven't seen it, then how can you assess it? So I think there's some protection there. Um, as long as you set out, we haven't seen it, we've asked for it, uh, they won't give it to us. Um, we're doing our best on the information we've got on our housing file. And how, and then finish it off with a conclusion. But before that, look at how you will mitigate any effect that this may have on the disabled person. Um, how you might mitigate the effect of any action that you're you're taking so it is difficult and it is a delicate task but if everything is structured correctly um, you can often reach uh, the right answer and have good evidence before the court so in terms of case preparation i'm i'm anxious that there is five minutes uh, left of this webinar so alistair if you can go to the first um PowerPoint, please, because I do want to get on to damages very quickly. So advance the right allegations. This will be well known to all of you. You want direct evidence. You want witnesses who are willing to attend court. You need a clear audit trail. That's what was said in Rosebury. Um, contemporaneous support. Have you got records of complaints? Is there some sort of independent evidence? Is it one neighbour against another? Or is there other things happening that you're able to draw upon? And make sure anything you're alleging is clear in terms of dates, times, and what happened. You will, you will know what the weaker evidence is. I'm not going to go through that. So in terms of uh, marshalling that evidence, if we can have the next slide, Alistair, um, heed your policies, make sure you're following them, ensure the court is presented with a clear picture, uh, provide simple methods of capturing information. Most of you will do this anyway. Keep good and clear interview and telephone notes, be clear on who the antisocial behaviour is impacted on, develop good relationships uh, with those who you hope will come forward and provide evidence and liaise with other organisations, for example, the police in terms of anything that you might be able to gather in terms of evidence from them. If you are compiling a schedule, which was one of the problems in the Rosebery, uh, Rosebery case, next uh, slide, Alistair, please. Have, choose your strongest allegations, that goes without saying, but have a checklist of all the facts you need to establish your case and make sure whatever you've put in your schedule, you can meet that in terms of the evidence before the court. Have a document checklist as well. Make sure you have the right exhibits before the court and make sure you have the right witnesses before the court, which leads me on to hearsay if you can't get people to come to court. Alistair, next slide, please. I'm going to dash through these. Everyone knows what hearsay uh, means and everyone knows what the court should be considering when it comes to uh, weight. But it is a common feature of antisocial behaviour cases. And there is often a reluctance for witnesses to come to court and give evidence uh, that are said or often said to stem from fear of reprisals. Well, we'll look at the case. A noise nuisance case is very different to someone who is uh, having threats of violence against them. And make sure that you uh, explain to uh, anyone who's saying, I won't come to court, the different ways in which um, they could give their evidence and the different methods to make them more comfortable. So behind a screen, via video, with someone supporting them. Uh, and um, there is a webinar that uh, was done during housing week that did look at the new practice direction in terms of vulnerable people before the court practice direction 1a i think it is um and that deals with witnesses as well as uh, claimants and defendants so uh, if you need uh, any further information on the sorts of things that are available for people who don't want to come to court um then do uh, go back and look at that webinar we have been warned before about this and it's a case that his honor judge luber did cite in um, rosebury as well um, and we're all aware of it it's the most moat housing group and harrison heartless it's a few slides on alistair we know that we have to be careful when putting hearsay before the court so if we have the next slide please alistair the best way, if a witness is not going to come to court, 
the best way to do it is try and have an anonymized statement. So don't put it within the officer's statement, have witness A giving evidence, resident B, and so on and so forth. And be specific and detailed in why they are unwilling to give all will evidence at court. And then finally, just be careful with exhibits. Next page, please. I've had cases where exhibits haven't been anonymized. Uh, that begs the question of why someone won't come to court because it's obvious um, as to who the complainant is. So really, really do be careful if you're uh, using hearsay evidence. So moving on to the next case, uh, next slides quickly. Um, the upshot of all of this in trying to get it right is keep things under review. Don't be influenced by the majority. I've put it that way. You know, we all know that there are people who will go straight to their MP and complain or go to your chief exec and try and get um, a quicker outcome for themselves. Just try and remain objective, uh, neutral when you're investigating. Keep an open mind. You might have legal proceedings in contemplation, but don't see that as the goal that you've got to achieve. Again, just stay balanced throughout, assess what's happening and come to your conclusions. And there's a few other bits on there about how uh, to keep things under review and provide the best uh, evidence to the court. Um, but just remember, above all, you do not have to press on. If something comes up, you do not have to press on. And I have had some success in cases where injunction claims have been stopped because of a mental health issue that's come about that wasn't known to uh, have no order as to cost before the court. And the court can be quite sympathetic to a landlord trying to do uh, its best and then something crops up that it didn't know about. It reassesses and immediately takes action and puts a stop to it. And the courts can be sympathetic to that. And so finally, in my section is the cost of getting it wrong. Now, um, I have run out of time um, and I know there was one question in the Q&A, which I was going to try and answer live in relation to damages. But if we can just quickly, Alistair, just move on to the guidance as to damages. So we've all heard of Vento and the Vento bands are set out there. And that is how uh, Rose Rosebury was assessed. Now, my general feeling is that some housing cases aren't easily slotted into Vento and the other employment cases in terms of trying to assess uh, damages and, and place them into brackets. But the um, Equality and Human Rights Commission guide to non-employment cases mentions Vento, and that is clearly uh, what the courts have been using in order to try and assess uh, damages in housing cases. So it, it's as best as the guide as we're getting, um, unless and until someone potentially makes the point. But um, those are the brackets. Um, they will change again. They're likely to increase slightly uh, from April this year. Um, if we can turn the page over, Alistair. So the aim, as we know, as we see in disrepair cases, it, the aim is to compensate for genuinely injured feelings. It's not to punish somebody. Who is found to be uh, who is found to have discriminated? Um, there's some examples there, but overall, it's going to turn on the facts and the circumstances of any individual case. The court will need to look at that very, very carefully. The court will want to try and put the claimant in the same position as far as possible, uh, had there not been the discrimination. And again, I think that's where it falls. Um, slightly differently in the guidance in terms of if it's an employment case that might be slightly easier to assess than if it's a, a housing case um, and any damages award are always going to include uh, injury for feelings but could include may include other financial loss um, that's encountered as a result in Rosebury of course um, it was injury to feelings now as um, Jensen um, has pointed out in question and answer session. The next three slides that um, I have for you demonstrate that prior to Rosebury, the courts have assessed matters at, at the lower level. So um, there's three there. We've just seen one for 4,500. That was failure to follow a policy. The one before you there is 3,000 pounds. That was where there were systematic failings found by the court in terms of how they conducted themselves 
in relation to the Equality Act. And the final one, um, there was £2,000 um, plus an uplift of 10%, um, where there was no evidence that any discrimination was deliberate. Um, it was simply the inclusion of a mandatory ground that was disproportionate, and that was the award there. But what we know now, following Rosebury, is that, uh, moving on to the next slide, please, Alistair, is that damages um, can be significant. And Alistair's already gone through that. So finally, and this is my final slide, um, which I appreciate has been a very quick canter through these issues. Do not underestimate the potential for damages. Yes, Rosebury currently looks like an outlier but we all know of his honour Judge Luba QC's reputation. We all know that that case is going to be utilised now in cases going forward. And it is quite clear that damages can reach uh, the top vento bracket, even if uh, they are at the bottom of them. So um, there is clearly potential for, for that type of award and higher. And those are the sorts of things set out in the slide, which could lead to a higher assessment than the uh, ones we have previously seen coming out of the uh, county court. So it is important that landlords attempt to uh, get it right as best as they can. Um, so that ends um, my section of the talk. Um, the next slide is um, three webinars that have been done by uh, Cornerstone Barristers. Um, these may be helpful not only for the questions and answers, uh, Q&As that are being raised in, in the feature, but also um, for some of the things that were raised um, prior to this webinar. We just simply haven't had time to cover things, for example, like capacity, which is obviously, uh, obviously arises in these types of cases. That was dealt with in the Dealing with Vulnerable Tenants um, webinar, which is available to you. There's a more detailed um, PSED webinar in relation to possession claims. And again, there's another one at the bottom there dealing with mental health problems and capacity. And I think that one has um, some court of protection discussion in there as well, because I know some people in the Q&A have been asking um, about whether you can sort of go to the court and seek uh, assessments and so on and so forth. So that may be helpful. Um, so it's just uh, for me now to say thank you uh, very much. We have run out of time. I do hope that some of the questions have been answered um, throughout uh, the webinar. Obviously, if people um, want to ask uh, further questions, then you have our emails there on that final slide. Do feel free to email us and I'm sure we'll try and get in touch. Um, it was um, so much to get through. So I really do hope you appreciate that um, we've, we've done our best. Um, even though some of it's been a bit of a rush and we haven't got to all of your questions. But uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, and that's goodbye. Thank you. Yes, and uh, may I also add my thanks to everyone for attending today. And um, uh, please do feel free to email us. Um, sorry, I haven't been able to get to everyone's questions in the Q&A, but you have on the slides um, our emails for any questions and we'll ensure that the slides are put up on our website or otherwise sent out uh, for people to refer to.